Welcome to the Seed Family Podcast, where we explore natural homeschooling, gentle parenting, simple living, and family adventure. I'm Rachel Rainbolt, the Sage Parenting Coach, coming to you from the Pacific Northwest, where I live wild and free in connection with my three wildlings and the papa bear in our fixer-upper on the beach. This is episode 45, and today I'm here with Diane Bowden talking about sentimentality. Diane is the voice behind the top-rated podcast, The Minimalist Moms, where she spreads her ideas and interviews others in regards to living a life in the pursuit of less. Her goal is simply think more and do with less. She lives in Columbus, Ohio with her husband and three kids. So join us around the campfire and let's get living the family life of our dreams. If you are enjoying the Sage Family Podcast, then please scroll down and click those stars in your podcast app or on iTunes. This is a quick and easy way to support the show using the currency of feedback. Jenny T. writes, you and your child will thrive with this information. If you want to feel more connected to your family, if you want to trust your children's development more and their natural brilliance, listen to this podcast. Once I heard the crackling of the fire in the intro to the podcast, I immediately felt excited for what was to come. Listening is calming, empowering, and informative. It's both artful and game-changing info that all parents need to have access to. Thank you, Jenny. I really appreciate you taking the time to leave such a kind and thoughtful review. For today's Adventure of the Week turned Thriving in Quarantine segment, I wanted to talk about food. Now, I have an entire episode on this topic that I recorded with Dina Barcela, and I invite you to go give it a listen. I'll include a link in the show notes. But I wanted to speak to it now because it's one of the things I'm seeing a lot of families struggling with as parents complain about their kids incessantly begging them for food all day. We don't experience this in our family because I am not the gatekeeper of the food. We fill our kitchen with healthy foods and my children go to the kitchen and eat whenever they're hungry. My kids have an incredible brain-body connection, a relationship with food that I do not insert myself in the middle of, along with issues of power, control, and shame. From the time my kids are old enough to walk, they walk over to the low shelves of the pantry or fridge and help themselves to prepped and portioned foods. Terrified your kids will binge on a 10-pound bag of Doritos? Then don't buy Doritos. Your active role is in designing the foodscape. My fridge is full of berries and carrots and yogurt, and right now I think the favorite protein is deli-sliced chicken madrasala, but you get the point. I front load the energy of setting them up for success with food, and then I give them the freedom to feel out the natural consequences of their choices. Eat all the blueberries in one day? Okay, we'll be going back to the grocery store next week. And when they finish something, they write it or draw it on the grocery list. But since I don't dictate what, when, where, and how they are, how they are to eat, they just eat when they're hungry and stop when they're not. It really can be that simple. Wes just made himself a peanut butter, banana, and honey sandwich with strawberries. Yesterday, Bay made everyone scrambled eggs. If this sounds appealing but you're not sure where to begin, start by simplifying your kitchen to contain only foods you would be comfortable with your family eating, which, quite frankly, is ideally how it should be anyway, right? Make the choices about how you want to nourish your body at the grocery store, not standing in front of the pantry. Front load the decision making around what you want to eat. Then prep the foods so the good stuff is visible, accessible, and ready to eat. If you listened to episode 44 on habits, then that should sound familiar as we're clearing any resistance in the environment. Then you can introduce your children to their kitchen and invite them to help themselves whenever they're hungry. 
You may see an initial stage of binging as they learn to trust that this is not temporary. Say nothing. Let them feel out the natural consequences of feeling full and observe and make note of any boundaries you might need to add. For example, maybe the kitchen closes at 4 p.m. so that everyone is ready for dinner together at 6. But be sparing with the boundaries because the point is really to get out of their way so they can learn to hear and honor the cues of their bodies and you can learn to trust in them. Remember, independence is born out of freedom. So if you're craving more independence in your children, you have to lean back and give them the space to grow into that independence. If you want to see photos and videos of our kitchen, then head on over to sage.family on Instagram and follow along. Diane is the voice behind the Minimalist Moms podcast, which I'm sure a lot of my listeners know well. Welcome, Diane. Share your story with us. Who are you and what are you all about? Yeah, my name is Diane Bowden. Thank you again for having me on the podcast. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. I am Diane Bowden, and I am a mother of three living in Columbus, Ohio. And basically, at this point, I would say that my main job is stay-at-home mom, but I have somewhat grown the podcast over the past year or so. And so I'm, I guess, maybe my title is podcaster now. Uh <laughs> Not so much a side hustle anymore, but yeah, I guess things that I enjoy, I, um, I really love to read. I really love coffee. I love being outside. I love living simply. And that's pretty much what I'm all about on the podcast is just intentional, simple, slow living, um, with an emphasis on family. And that's why we're the minimalist moms podcast. So Yeah. I love it. That's so my jam. So I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. Absolutely. All right. So let's dive right in here. And I want to ask you, why is it so much harder to simplify the sentimental things? Yeah. So when I knew that we were going to be discussing sentimental items, I sat down and I wanted to kind of think through some of my thoughts. And I think that sentimental items are just, they're just so saturated in memories. And I think that it's difficult to detach ourselves from memories and they're so wrapped up in our emotions. So as we're processing through some of these items, going through these items and trying to figure out what to purge and what not to, it's not just the item that we're feeling like we're giving up. It's the emotion and the memory connected to it. But um, we'll get into that a little bit more. But obviously we're always going to keep those memories and that's the... I think it makes it easier if we can remember that at the forefront of our mind as we're kind of getting rid of some of these more sentimental items is that you're not letting go of the memory. You're letting go of the possession. Right, right. When I went through all of my sentimental things, it was emotionally exhausting as like every object brought me right back to relive that moment. So I think just maybe... Like, I totally agree with you. And just knowing when you go into it that it's going to take more time and more emotional energy than going through, you know, like a pantry and <laughs> and throwing out expired food. Because you do, when you pick up the item, you really are kind of brought back to that place. But once you move through that memory, then you can make a good choice about the item and you can let all of these things go. So I think a lot of people, like they sit down with that childhood box and they pick up an item and the memories start flooding and then they close that box back up and run away. Like I just want to kind of empower people and invite people to to not be afraid of those memories. I know a lot of them can be emotionally charged, but we talk a lot about mindfulness on this show and particularly in the context of parenting, right? Like when you feel triggered by something that it's okay to sit in that feeling and let it move through you like a wave. It's really the same thing when you're going through these sentimental items that these memories are going to be triggered and these emotions can move through you and just know that they will pass like for better, for worse. These, that, that emotion that's triggered by those thoughts and by going back to that experience will move mm-hmm. through you and it will, it will move on. And then you can, um, do what you will with the object. Yeah. And like you said, I think sometimes we do have more of a negative or bad memory attached to some of these items. And I think that 
if that if that's the case, I'm thinking maybe specifically not so so much a bad memory, but say your parent has passed away and you're going through their things, but it's too difficult to kind of process some of those emotions. I guess I would say choose the items that are most special to you. Maybe your mother has a lot of cool vintage dresses or she had some really neat jewelry. And I'd say choose a few of those pieces and wear them or use them or display them. And that way they're not just sitting in a closet. Um, because I think that so often we just allow these things to stay as little like curated, not museums, but we never go back and look at them again. And so I, (laughs) there you're having this weight of this emotion and it's building and building and building because you haven't taken the time to address it. And so I think that if you want to preserve the memory, I guess, like tangibly to display it or wear it, use it up is what I like to say. And that way you are kind of decluttering some of the stuff, but you can still have those little tangible mementos. Yes. Okay, good. And we're going to, and we're going to talk more about use in a little bit. Cause that's something I, I definitely agree with and want to dive more into, but so first I want to, I want to touch a little bit on the narrative piece because Humans understand themselves within the context of their narrative, and our keepsakes can tell the story of our past. So I want to empower everyone listening to curate your story. You get to do that. I was holding on to like my middle school yearbooks, even though I didn't particularly enjoy middle school <laughs> and like would, you know, go back to these like bad memories every time I saw them. And let him, letting them go was a powerful experience for me. Like the, the tangible things when you let them go really do carry like psychological weight of like letting things go. So I no longer have to hold on to and carry the weight of those experiences. It's very freeing. Um, what do you say to people who are holding on to things that make them feel bad? Yeah. So I guess my first question is why, (laughs) why you (laughs) under things that make you feel bad? (laughs) That should probably be after I always tell people when they start decluttering their home, start in the bathroom because there isn't sentimentality attached to any of the items in the bathroom. So that said, as you are starting to go through some of these sentimental items, I question why are you holding on to things that make you feel bad? Because that just seems kind of what's the word when you're a masochist? Is that when you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It seems kind of masochistic if that's a word. But yeah, I just, I do wonder what is wrapped up in that ma- bad negative feeling. Is it guilt that you're feeling really? Is it obligation that you're feeling? So maybe we can kind of dive deeper into what bad actually means, where that stems from, or what your negative feeling, where that kind of originates. And I would start diving slightly deeper. And again, we don't have to like psychoanalyze ourselves necessarily to start decluttering. I would say that if it is something bad and you're having a harder time decluttering it, like maybe have a friend or your spouse or a close family member come over and help you as you're decluttering and have them be the ones to toss out the item. I think back just personally, I had just kind of similar to you in in high school, I had, I don't know, I don't want to call it a partying phase, but I, (laughs) I wasn't who I wanted to be maybe my junior year of high school. And I look back at some of the pictures, um, that I had at that time period where I was out partying a little bit more than I would have wanted to. And I just tossed all of those because it's not something that one, I ever want to remember because that's not the life that I ultimately wanted to lead. I know I was a child basically at that point, but I just didn't need to associate any emotions to that. Like I didn't want to think about that more than I already had. I'd already overcome in my own mind. And so I didn't need that tangible evidence, I guess, of that time period. And I didn't ever want my kids necessarily seeing that. I didn't want my parents stumbling upon those photos. So again, like I am just being transparent with you and the listeners that that was the time that I did have a negative emotion attached to. And it was easier for me just to say, let, let's get rid of these. I'm never going to look at these again. I don't want to. And it was easy to just like push them out. Yeah. Cause keep in mind that you're curating your story, not just for yourself, but for your children. Mm-hmm. I mean, what story do you want your keepsakes to tell future generations about your life? I am still struggling to forgive my mother for 
the horde that I had to go through in the wake of her death. Because if, if you don't do it, your children are going to have to. So curate that story of your life for them through the keepsakes you choose to keep. And really, like you mentioned, and I had a, I had similar experience going through like all of my photos, choosing what photos I wanted to keep. It's really, it's a really, um, important invitation when you go through this stuff to kind of make your peace with these chapters in your life or these memories that are triggered by these objects. So for example, I I had a party phase too. <laughs> and looking through those pictures, I was able to say like, I'm really grateful that I had that experience because I chose to like I, I was very driven and got my degrees very young and chose to get married and have children and what most people would consider young. And and that that phase was an important phase that allowed me to sort of move through a lot of um individuation like more quickly like so like I'm grateful that I was able to have that experience and now I can let it go and move forward Mm -hmm. no I can 100% relate my husband and I were married at 22 as well and we had our first child at 26 which is I know people have kids younger than that but yeah I think I think that it is helpful to I I I think when you're looking back at some of these items that you're keeping, again, you may have already made peace with the emotions that you have somewhat attached to these items. And so I think that if you have made peace, then it might be easier for you to get rid of those items. And maybe you hadn't made peace with some of those past memories. And then maybe that's a good thing that's prompting you to kind of work through that so that you can overcome it. Yes, absolutely. And I just want people to like look at these sentimental objects and and frame it as this is the story of my life. Like if I were gone tomorrow, these would be the this would be, you know, like the time capsule that that were the 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 artifacts that, you know, the historians would look at. Like this is what these are the 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 objects that your children and your grandchildren are going to use to help tell the story of your life. So what do you want that story to be? I just want people to like be mindful of that and curate that. And it's a good thing. Like you get to throw away the stuff that you don't want and you get to, and you get to really emphasize the things that really matter and feel important to the story of who you are. So I just want people to get conscious with that storying that they get to do. Yeah. And not to go on too much of a side tangent, but just if someone is experiencing as they're listening to this, if they kind of have that item in mind that they know is going to be difficult to process, whether or not they have their bad behavior associated with it or just whatever comes up in their life. I just want people to know, like, look, you and I have had the same connection because we've been there and we've processed this and just you're not alone, I guess, in what you're going through and experiencing. And there's a lot of people that have been there and in similar situations. And I think so often as we're kind of processing some of these emotions and going through these items, it can feel like we're alone or we have been the only one to have made this mistake or this just brings up something yucky. And I think that we have to remember that like, you really aren't, that sounds so woo woo and cliche, but it really is true. And it, yeah. it's funny to have heard you say that just because we don't know each other and we're having this conversation, right? <laughs> we have this connection. And so I think that, I don't know, it's, it's helpful for me as I'm kind of going through whatever in life to know that there are other people that can connect in the same way as me. So it's just a side tangent. <laughs> No, I love it. And I, I completely, completely agree. I think a lot of times we're like, so I have this, this thing that I've noticed that if I repeat something, it's, and I don't mean like in the context of the podcast, but like in life, if I'm repeating something, it's because like, it hasn't been validated yet. Like there's something in what I'm saying that I, like I, I'm still having a need or it still needs more attention. And I just, I found the same thing with um, like my sentimental sentimental items, like if I was holding on to something, I was still having some sort of need to be validated around something in that object. And so even just having conversations like with other like-minded people helped me to feel ready to let go of it, you know? So like I, 
um, called up a friend who was like, like I had this big chunk of pictures from this one trip I took and I like sent a couple to my friend and I called her and we like had a conversation about it. And then I felt totally ready to like, let those go. Like, so just to like have experiences validated by people in your life who get it can really help you to feel ready to, to let, to let go of them. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Okay, so what criteria do you recommend to help people decide what to keep and what to let go of? So I wouldn't say that I necessarily have a criteria that I draw out for people or anything, but I think that the best advice that I do have here is just you have to be realistic and you just need to find basically a balance, I would say, between your past and your present. And um, again, if you're just holding on to an item because of guilt or obligation, it's time to let it go. And it was kind of cool because I had a moment just the other day. I'm trying to think what was it that I was going through. Oh, it was just kids clothes. Um, Nothing negative or bad associated with kids clothes. But I was realistic in the fact that I don't think that we're having any more children. I'm pretty much 100% positive. And it's, it's hard to purge some of that stuff. And I, I do have a little container, which we can talk about if we get to keepsakes and whatnot, but I do have a small container of clothes, but why am I holding on to bins of children's clothes if I'm never going to need them again? And yeah. realistically, if I'm realistic with myself and honest and rational, it's I'm not going to be using those. And so I put them in the donation bin and they're going to be donated. And I I guess, like I said, I don't have a criteria. It's just, I think you have to be bluntly honest with yourself about what it is that you're trying to get rid of. If you're going to use it again, if you're going to fit into those jeans again that you have from your twenties, if, (laughs) um, which right now I'm not fitting in those jeans. So I had to get some of those and I'm trying to think of something else that's been super sentimental to me. One of the things that I haven't been able to get rid of, I have some race medals from, running half marathons and I was never a runner. And so the first time that I was able to complete one, that was just such a special moment to me. And now I've run several, but I can't seem to part with those medals. And so I have them, I can get them right now. I'm recording from in my closet and they're in a box underneath. So I'm kind of going against what I've said to like use it up and display. So I think things like that, like just remember that we're all going to have an area that's somewhat of a struggle when it comes to sentimentality. But as you're going through it, just be as realistic as possible. Oh, I love that story about your medals. <laughs> it's funny. I had um, in my like childhood box this um, trophy. I think I even posted a picture of it on Instagram. It's like a trophy with a horse on it from when I run from when I won grand champion at horseback riding camp. And <laughs> it's this like, you know, trophies, right? Like this big plastic shiny thing that I have no interest in displaying in my house. <laughs> So I took a picture of it. And that's like one thing that always really helps me is if I'm, I'm feeling like really attached to something, but I, but I, I also recognize that I don't have, um, a use for this object and I'm never going to want to display it is that like, I can take a picture of it. So it's, it's, it sparks the same memories and it provides the same evidence for me. It's like, this was a moment of like victory, you know? So like, I still have the photo and I can still look to it anytime I want without keeping this big, Mm -hmm trophy. (laughs) I think I have long-term goals of having an office in my home one day and I'll display this little shrine to my, (laughs) (laughs) and I think it's mostly because if we are kind of digging deep, like I said to do, I was never an athlete growing up. I was always more artsy. And so Mm. I never had those little trophies from uh, middle school or high school. And so to me, this just seems so special. And it's just, I always ask people on my podcast, or I guess, certain people, um, what is something that you can't minimize? What's your minimalist confession? And this is certainly one of mine. So <laughs> no, I love it. I, I totally love it. And I totally get it. Cause I was the same way. Like the reason this trophy was so special to me was cause I had no other trophies. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. So like, while does it spark joy worked well in other areas for me, I found different criteria to be more helpful with sentimental items. So would I shed a tear over its loss if it burned in a fire? And do I want my children to inherit this when I die? 
Like I found those two questions Mm -hmm. that like when I asked myself as I was going through my sentimental items to be helpful, they provided some clarity for me. Like would I cry over this if it burned in a fire? Do I want my children to inherit this? Yeah, that's good. That's good. All right. So now circling back to that use thing. So what should we do with the keepsakes that we choose to keep? I know you talk about like using them, displaying them. And I love that. So like if you have um, a special, like I have um, a, what is it called? A carafe, this like crystal, like princess house carafe that um, my mom gave me. And rather than keep it like in a packed away in a box or in some cupboard that we never use like we use it (laughs) it's in like the functional part of my kitchen we when I make like a big breakfast we put our orange juice in it like so if you have these keepsakes use them display them incorporate them in your life and then in addition to that we have um boxes so in uh, the organization podcast with Shira Gill that I just put out there not too long ago, we talked about being like zero waste. And really one of the only exceptions was like a keepsake box. So each member of my family has a keepsake box, it's like a big plastic bin. Um, and they get to put whatever they want in that keepsake box, but they only get one. So all the sentimental things have to be in it. Um, and then, so for our family of five, we have 12 boxes. I have like my belly cast from when I was, from my last pregnancy in one. I have my wedding dress in one. Each of my five family members has one childhood box. And then we have like a family box. Um, We have a holiday box. And then I think like we have, I think that leaves me three shy of 12. And so we have three boxes of toys that like three different sets of things that we decided that we want to keep like for future grandkids one day um like the thomas trains we had like a box of those that all three of our kids played with that we chose to keep we're going to keep the lego box which is still in use like my kids still play with that one so just those are like the 12 keepsake boxes that we have decided to keep and for some people like that may seem like a crazy lot amount of stuff um for other people they 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 may see that as like so little stuff but those are the like it's an intentional choice that we made that we feel good about like everybody gets one box i'm keeping my wedding dress i'm keeping up my belly cast we have like um holiday ornaments that are included in there so those are the things that we've chosen to keep, but really we try to use and display as much as we can. Yeah, absolutely. That was one thing that I was going to say as well. Just make sure that you're limiting the keepsake keepsake storage just because it will become overwhelming and it, it will overrun your basement and then you're not going to be able to find anything. And one of the things phrases or mantras that I kind of like to live by is if everything your favorite, then nothing is really your favorite. And Mm -hmm. so I would say as you're kind of curating and cultivating these keepsake boxes, continually go back through them. And I would just say that even your children can do this if they have a special box of things that like maybe you just can't stand the things they have in this box. This is their box to where they can put whatever they want. And then as they get older, they can kind of go back through the box and see what they want to keep. So I know for me, I have boxes for each of them. And then I've allowed Charlotte her own box of things that she wants to keep at this point because she's five. So I feel like she has say now, mm-hmm. <laughs> as opposed to my two and a half year old that kind of doesn't know what's going on. So. <laughs> Yeah, I just, for me, I have a handful of sentimental things in there. Like her first ballet leotard is very sentimental to me. And I'd like to either save it for her. And if she doesn't want it, then I might just hold on to it. So yeah, I think that that is important to definitely have a a place for keepsakes, but just make sure that it's not your entire basement. Because like I said, it's, it's not... It loses its meaning the more keepsakes that you have. Does that make sense? Yes, I completely, completely agree. And like I said, like each each a member of our family of five has one keepsake box. And I love that you brought up that point that it's we're going through it on a regular basis because the kids will have something that they'll want to add to the box. And if it's full, we'll say like, okay, so what thing do you want to take out? Like what thing is this more important than? So we're constantly kind of, um, curating that box as we add things to it. Like I put, um, 
um, like a, a baby outfit from each of them in their keepsake box. Um, our toddler Tula is in my youngest's box because he went everywhere in that and it's still in really good condition. But it's like such like a keepsake thing, I feel like for me and, and my little ones. But if he, it's his box. So like if he gets older and decides that there is, are other things that are more important, then he is welcome to take that out of the box. So it's sort of this like you said, like it's sort of always being um, curated and then just be mindful. Yeah, like you said, of how much you have because the more you have, the less um, importance each thing, each e- the less weight each thing gets to carry mm-hmm. in the overall picture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're just as, they're not as meaningful. Yeah, exactly. And I love to hearing about like the different things, like I know you've shared a couple examples and I love that, the different things that people keep because, you know, like I chose to keep my wedding dress. I know a lot of other people, minimalists, especially who have no interest in keeping a wedding dress. Yeah, I keep trying to sell mine and no one wants it. I'm like, (laughs) you should want it. (laughs) And I totally, I totally get that. For me, like my parents were married and divorced a tremendous amount of times um like step siblings ex step siblings half siblings um lots of coming and going step parents and so for me like being able to for my kids to have two parents who are married and to be able to give them sort of a piece of that that they can carry into their own marriages like I I plan on just telling them like they are welcome to chop it up or use it however they want you they can make a ribbon to tie around a bouquet I don't care they can do whatever they want with it but I would just it feels so special to me to be able to offer um, a piece of that it's sort of this because it's this thing that I didn't grow up with and I didn't have and if it doesn't resonate with my kids and they have no interest in it that's totally fine I will let go of it but just it feels worth it to me to be able to offer that based on like my life experiences and not having that. So I just want everybody to know that like don't worry about what other people are keeping and letting go of. And I'm, I'm hoping that these examples will help you to see that what's really meaningful and important to one person is, is not going to be meaning and important to other people. So just to be really in touch with like what things are really meaningful to you and why they're meaningful and just curate that story. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Okay, how I want to talk about photos. Okay. So, how do you store older photos? So, I don't have a ton of photos printed out. I will say the ones that I do have printed out, I have baby books for each of my kiddos. And so, that was basically, well, I don't have one for my third child. I probably should <laughs> not because he's six months old at this point. But I have the first year of their life just. It, it was something that I wasn't really intending on doing. I just had a girlfriend that bought me scrapbooks. But anyways, I have... <laughs> no, same here. Like my first two have scrapbooks and then my third does not because at the time my sister was scrapbooking and had all the stuff. And so I was doing it with her and now my poor third has yeah. no scrapbook. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh no. But um, I don't have a scrap or... I don't have a ton of photos printed out. I just a few mm-hmm. in there. But that said, I do do a scrapbook every year on Shutterfly. And so I feel like it's very user friendly. And I basically just upload photos from my phone directly to the app. And then I can get on my computer and I do them if there's some kind of event. So Christmas, we'll say, or Easter or Fourth of July, I will try and organize those photos in the scrapbook within that week or else I get behind. And then at the end of the year, I just print out the Shutterfly book. So I guess you have to be slightly more intentional about doing this, but it if you are on top of it, it doesn't seem like that much work because you are just going in real quick. It only takes like 20 minutes to make a page and you do that. Like you don't have a ton of events. And then for just the random photos you're taking on the day-to-day on your iPhone. I just usually create like fall, spring, winter, summer, and then put the photos in from that time. And they're just, there's not a ton of organization, but at least they're in a scrapbook and that way they're not taking up a ton of extra space, but space, but those are very important to me to have. So. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Photos are like photos and videos are my number one sentimental item like ultimately if I lost everything else as long as as long as I still had my photos I'd be good so I first I went through and I like 
pruned and curated them all. So in my mom's stuff and in my childhood boxes that I got from her, um, I had tons of like school photos. You know, you'd get like an envelope and there are like 40 photos. Yeah. (laughs) So I just took like one, right? So I took like one eight by 10 or whatever the largest size photo was in that envelope from each um, you know, grouping or event or whatever. So like I had like a hundred photos from sixth grade camp. I took like three of them. And so I just went through and really like pruned, um, a lot of the, the photos that I had because really like pre-digital age and maybe I'm aging myself here, but back when I was growing up, we didn't like We couldn't take a a picture on our phone and look at it. Yeah. (laughs) So we had like rolls of film that we would take to like Costco and get developed. So we would take like 20 pictures Mm -hmm. and then there'd be like one good shot because you couldn't see what you were taking. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of photos that were really easy to like pick the one best shot and then just throw the rest away. Mm -hmm. So after like pruning all of that... Um, I wrote, I labeled the back of each photo with the year or any, if there was any like pertinent information, like I said, like I had like a hundred photos of sixth grade camp, I would write like the year and then sixth grade camp. Um, and then I put them all, uh, in, well, for, I put them all in a cardboard photo box. Like I got them from Ikea. They were super cheap and, and they're all in that box chronologically. Um, and then those photo boxes are in my childhood keepsake boxes but all of the photos are digitized so that was like the most important thing to me is that I had all of the photos digitized so of course like post smartphone they're all just on my phone and automatically back up backed up to the cloud so um, one of the things I chose to invest in is high storage on my phone and then I pay um, for high storage in the cloud and that gives me a tremendous peace of mind that all my photos are backed up automatically as I take them so that if my house washed away in a flood I would still have all of these photos that are so precious to me. Mm-hmm. I'd pay for the same um, the extra storage because I find that really helpful. I also have a little side hustle of photography so photos are very important to me too and one of my biggest tips I would say from the day to day or um, within your day to day would be at the end of the day, as I'm scrolling, as I know that we all do, I make sure that I go into my photo app on the iPhone and I delete any photos that aren't the best. So you yes. have several images of your child with cake on their face. Make sure if you need to save like two, then save two. But otherwise, you don't need eight to ten of the same type of image like choose your favorite and then delete the other ones and that kind of cuts down on the digital clutter as well and then you know that when you go to make your scrapbook or go to save that you're only saving the best yes I love that tip and I do the same thing like when I get home from our adventures I will that's like what I do to like decompress when I after I like get out of the shower and I like kick back and I chill as I pull up the photos from the day and I mark my favorites and then I delete all the rest because especially when you're like in action it living a really adventurous life you're not like stopping in the moment and curating the images you're just especially kids are moving fast so I'm just like taking a bunch of pictures taking a bunch of pictures and then I get home and I delete probably like 80 percent of the photos that I took yeah same (laughs) (laughs) so how are your digital keepsakes organized and stored um basically I have one for each of my children so that's just pretty straightforward and simplistic. And then I, not so much anymore, but I was going on at least a trip a year by myself when my husband and I were first married. Um, I would do like a girl's trip. So I have one folder for myself, one folder for my husband and I, and then I know we're all about the screenshots and this I feel like we all take screenshots on our phone. So I have an album just on my phone for reference, I guess. So it's pretty straightforward. There's nothing like too complex to it because I think that when you start to have a ton of folders that you have to access, that's when you stop doing it. Like if I throw everything in to my children's individual folders, it makes it just a lot more helpful. 
Yeah, I agree. Like all the pre-digital age stuff, like all the stuff that I actually scanned in, I, I named the photo for the year and a descriptor. Like I said, it might be like the year and then prom or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I stored in the folder for the person. So like there's a folder for me and a folder for my husband. And all of the photos from each of our childhoods are there and they automatically are backed up to the cloud. Um, so like I have in my photos folder, a Rachel folder, and then 1994 Washington, wow. D.C. or whatever. And mm -hmm. this system gives me such peace of mind. Um, my photos and videos are my most precious keepsake. And just like I said, if my house was like washed away in a tsunami, like they would be safe. That gives me such peace of mind. <laughs> Plus, they're so easy to find and look at and reference. Like if I'm texting with a friend joking about... I don't know, a trip to Disneyland. Like I can pull up a photo of it right on my phone and send it to her and we can have a good laugh at our dorkiness. Or my kids can quickly and easily pull up a photo of me at their exact age and ponder the resemblance. Um, the other day, my kid who was getting braces asked how old I was when I had them and we just pulled up my childhood folder and scrolled through until we saw metal in my smile and looked at the name of the photo and that tells us the year. So Having those like organized is really, really helpful for me. And then post-digital age, I haven't really found a need for that. Like, I can't really individualize them because we're really like all in all of the photos, but the actual modern technology does a pretty good job of that. Like you can search by face and you can like search by year, mm -hmm. um, even you can even search by location. So I find like the modern, the post-digital age stuff is pretty easy. Mm -hmm. um, the pre-digital age stuff I had to be really intentional with, but it only takes doing that one time and then it's done. Um, so just keep that in mind too. It's not something you have to do over and over. Like take that big pile of photos, throw away, like prune mm -hmm. all the things, you know, label them, scan them, um, and you can take them someplace like Costco and they do it for pretty inexpensive. They'll digitize all of your photos, um, all of your old like videos and things. Um, just get it all digitized and then organize it all in the folders and whatnot. And then it's done and you have it forever. Like for the rest of my life, I will have easy access to all of these things. Yeah, it's um, you're making me think about some of the photos that I still have at my parents' house that I probably do need to go through because I honestly, like I said, I don't only really have any tangible photos in my husband and I's home, but I know that they have boxes upon boxes of photos just from our childhood that I'm going to have yes. at some point. So I think that might be a good idea to actually even go through just together with them, do it. We see them every Sunday. So maybe if people are feeling along the same lines as me, like you have that time set apart to kind of walk down memory lane and go through those together. I don't know. Yes. Oh my gosh. I cannot even tell you how much I love that. Being able to go through them with your parents uh -huh. is such a gift. I mean, you guys can like live through those memories and ask them questions, especially because if you were a kid, you know, they're going to have this perspective and this higher level of information and detail than you're going to have if you're going through these after they're gone, which realistically, I mean, that's what you're facing if you don't do it when you're, when they're still alive. So to be able to do this with them would be amazing. I love that idea. You'll have to tell me how it goes if you do this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move into our Q&A. So I asked the Sage family community what questions they had about sentimentality, and I'm going to hit you with two questions today. Okay. Um, Caitlin asks, what tips do you have for declining sentimental items from family? What do you do when someone wants to give you something that was important to them, but you really don't want it? So I have a couple of thoughts, and they're both probably not the kindest, <laughs> <laughs> stay with me here. Okay. okay. Well, actually, one's more kind. So my first reaction, if my mom is starting to give me something that she doesn't want to keep, but wants me to have, I am kind of questioning her mom. If you don't want it, why would I want it? But I feel like I'm so <laughs> honest. I'm, I'm maybe a little bit too direct with my mom in that sense, but I would just wonder why yeah, if it's something that they don't want to have in their home anymore, why are they pushing it out? And maybe you can ha kind of dialogue with them. Um, maybe this is an opportunity to kind of chat and see why it is that they don't want it anymore and toss it together. And then the kind way I would just say is to accept the item because with any type of gift giving, I feel like it's 
in the experience, like that person wants to give you this thing. And for them, it's the experience of giving it to, to you that's important. And so once it's yours, you can do with it as you, as you wish. And if that means it's going directly into the trash can when you get home or into the recycling <laughs> bin or to the thrift shop, wherever it needs to go, that is, is it's no longer theirs. It's yours. And so you can do with it what you will. Does that make kind of make some sense? Yeah. yeah. Like I, I mean, my response is like really simple is just no, thank you. <laughs> like there were a great many number of conversations I had with my mom over the years in which that was my response to her trying to give me sentimental things. Okay. Just no, thank you. And she would, you know, push and push. And sometimes I would um, I found that coming up with practical reasons for why I would, would say no would be helpful for her. So I might, if she's trying to give me something breakable, I might say, um, like our three kids have full access to everything in our house. So if you give me something breakable, it's going to get broken. Um, which if you're okay with that, then I'll take it and use it, but know that it will get broken like and you know so then she might choose to keep it but I I try to be I try to practice like radical honesty Mm -hmm. and so if I don't want something I'll be honest about it and I'll say no thank you I I have said numerous times to people that like when I've asked them like why that object is important to them I'll I'll, you know, engage really positively in a conversation around them with that. And then I'll say, yeah, it doesn't have um, sentimental value for me the way it does for you. Like, I I love that story and I can totally see that for you. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't feel any of that for it. So if it's special to you, you know, you can keep it. Or if you're ready to let go of it, you can let go of it. But it doesn't have any sentimental value for me. Um, So I try to just be really, really honest and keep it simple. And sometimes people need it on a practical level. So you can say that you don't have space to store it if it's true. Or like I've said, things in my house will get broken, which is not not a lie. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So those are... Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say those are some ideas that have been helpful for me. No, those are great ideas. A couple more things as I'm processing this a little bit more as you're talking. I know that my parents, they saved my childhood childhood bunk bed um, that my sister and I shared. And it's a really nice bunk bed. It's wooden and it has um, a desk on one side, a bookshelf on the other. It's very, very nice. But my husband and I just kind of have had the rule we don't want bunk beds right now. Our kids are way too young and like maybe long term we don't even ever want the bunk bed. So that's yeah. somewhat difficult. That's the only thing that I feel like they've ever tried to like push on to me because it's taking up space in their basement. And I've just kind of told them, hey, you know what our lifestyle is like. You know that we're trying to pursue minimalism or living with less as much as we can. And we're very intentional about what we bring into our house. And so sometimes with family members, you have to just keep reiterating that fact by the way that you live, like show them that that is true of you and your family. And I know that there are certain family members of ours that we've had to be very repetitive with that fact. And there is one individual in particular that she does try to give her love languages for sure gifts. She loves to receive gifts, um, not in a greedy way, but just she yeah. feels loved that way. And she loves to give gifts, even if it's just a cake that she's made for us or if it's leftovers from dinner. But my husband and I are not necessarily wanting a cake in our house all week. We do for her, for her specifically, we will bring it home. Hopefully she's not listening to your podcast, but... <laughs> We'll bring it home and we just dump it in the trash can if there is. And I hate to waste food, but I know that she doesn't want it. We don't want it. But for us, like I said, it's in that exchange that makes her so happy. And that's important to me to give that to her at this point because she just doesn't take no for an answer at this point. And I think that there Mm -hmm. are some people in your life that are just not going to understand the way that you're living and the way that you're choosing to live. And this has been like eight years that I've tried to explain this to her. And I think she's like somewhat starting to get it now, but it's just (laughs) personalities. I think it's, it's hard. So like I said, I think that if you just need to take the item and then either donate it, recycle it, trash it, whatever you got to do is. (laughs) Yes. I love that point you're bringing up about the repetition. Like it often takes so many repetitions and I love what you said about show them who who you are, show them how you and your family live. Like that's beautiful and so well said. And that does sometimes require a lot of repetition. And sometimes you're just taking the thing and letting it move through you to someone else who needs it more. Like when, when people give us food, 
that we don't want, we literally just like on the way home, stop by like um, someone on the street and just yeah. hand it to them, you know, or like clothes or something. We'll just go straight to the donation center and drop them there. So like it doesn't even get in our house. Yeah, no, that's that's great. You're more sustainable than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, like, that was not meant cake. to be judgy. <laughs> can't have this cake. It's going right to the trash. Eat <laughs> thing by tomorrow. All right. Lynette asks, how do you work through sentimental items of a partner's while you work together to declutter certain spaces, especially when the partner is known to be very attached to such items? So this is kind of another one that I would say that you somewhat need to just live by example. I think that boundaries are really important here. I think that if you are a part, if you are married, if you are partners, then you are on the same team and you're working towards something together. So I think to have that conversation with one another, what are we working towards in our family? What, what, what kind of clutter are we okay with? What, how many boxes are we okay with storing in the basement? And if they are someone that likes their things a little bit more, then just continue, um, pruning your items and like live by that example, as I said, because I don't think it's fair to necessarily push that on them. But like I said, if you are a team, I would hope that you can somewhat unify and compromise. Um, it just might not be exactly what you want, but that's the whole point of compromise. It's not going to look a hundred percent your way. It's going to be 50, 50. And I think that's important. And I think there's growth for both of you within that. But, um, I think that, long term you are <laughs> I think that as long as you are respectful and how you're kind of condensing some of the household things that aren't specifically theirs I think that you can do that as well so I think that you should just throw them all away when they're not home <laughs> I'm just kidding <laughs> done that and it doesn't go well I'm totally kidding. Do not do that, guys. Yeah, I completely agree with everything Diane just said. You just move through your stuff. Like, just be a role model. And it's really contagious. I mean, I, you definitely want to go through your stuff letting go of an attachment to to what they decide to do with their stuff. Like, move through your stuff for you. Mm-hmm. But also, when you are in connection with someone, there is a powerful force in that Um, There's a powerful magnetism in that. And when you are growing and evolving and improving and taking steps that actually make your life better and make you feel better, um, they really are drawn to move through that evolution with you. Um, That's just sort of the nature of relationships, right? So just move through this stuff for you and in have that door open for your partner to be included in it. Like while I was going through photos of my childhood, um, you know, I'd call my husband and be like, oh my God, look at this photo. Or, you know, I'd like show him like, oh, look, this is my baby outfit or whatever. So I'm I'm sort of involving him in the fun of like going through some of these things and 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 letting so many of them go. So he gets to like bear witness to that and be a part of it. And then he wanted to do the same for his. So we got all these of boxes of mine like childhood boxes when my mom passed away and and I went through all of mine and then of of course like he pulled out like his box and as I'm digitizing all of my photos like well he wants his photos digitized too so like then he's going through his and we're getting them all digitized Mm -hmm. so just like doing it together and making it something really positive and something that like adds to your connection and and then just live really um like visibly, like be transparent so that the people um, around you can see um, how it's helpful for you. Yeah. And then just one last thought. I think that if you were to just start condensing and paring down your partner's possessions, I think that honestly, that's going to cause more harm than good. Because I know for someone like me and my personality, I'm probably going to be stubborn. And if I was even exactly. with it on board, I would be angry with you and probably try and keep things and ho- hold on to them tighter. And so I think that could really backfire if you start to toss things that aren't yours to toss. So... Yes, that is 100% accurate as someone with a degree in therapy. (laughs) Just to like validate that. Yeah, if if your partner is pushing you or taking control of your things, 
you are going to dig in your heels Mm -hmm. and be stubborn and keep far more things than you would have had your partner not pressured you. So like don't pressure, but invite. Like it's like a delicate balance, but it's one that like if you're on the right side of it, it makes a huge difference. Like I, there, I am a big fan of inviting, like in parenting as, in general, um, I invite my kids. I don't pressure or force or take over. Um, and really all of those same skills like are true for all relationships, but especially your partnership relationship. Yeah. And then also maybe in the home, this is just one last thought. Sorry, I keep going on. But no, I love it. My husband has a little space carved out for himself in the basement. It's his little workshop. And maybe this isn't available for everyone, but for some people it might work. And he has this awful giant, like guppy fish head (laughs) down. (laughs) Does it sing? No, no, no. It's actually, I, I don't, maybe it's not a guppy. I can't think of what it's called. A guppy's tiny. This is huge. And it's his great grandfather's and his great grandfather caught this fish and mounted his head on his back. And I just was really hoping in the move that it would somehow get displaced (laughs) and it somehow made it to the workshop. Like, you know, I don't go in that space. It's your space. You can keep what you want in there. I just don't want to have to be in your, like, I don't know if we can carve out spaces for one another to just be our unique selves and to store what we want in those spaces. I think that can be beneficial too. So yes. Oh my God. I a hundred percent agree. Like no criticism, um either like that falls in the like pressure category like no criticism no judgment like they have their keepsake box or their workshop space or whatever it is and they get to put whatever they want in there yes (laughs) there's we have this joke my husband and I he has this notebook from when he was like a kid that has different cards like baseball cards or whatever just like random cards and when we first got together I like railed on him that like you know, you know, he's like, they're, they're worth money. I'm like, great, then sell them. We could use the money. Like, <laughs> I just like railed on him on how stupid it was that he had these, this note that, like he didn't have hardly any sentimental things, but he had this notebook with these worthless cards that felt so dumb to me. And because I said, I, using those words, I said them many, many years ago, we got together when we were teenagers. He still has that notebook. Like he's, he's going to have that notebook the day that he dies. Like they're going to have to cremate him with that stupid notebook. <laughs> Because, because I said something about it like 20 years ago, I like criticized it and judged it. Now he's like never going to get rid of that notebook. So even though I haven't said anything about it in years, every once in a while, if we're going through sentimental stuff, he'll pull it out and make a big show of it. Like, oh, look, it's my precious notebook with my very special and highly valuable card. So yeah, yeah. the whole judgment and criticism thing, just don't do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move into our deep dive. The show notes can be found at rachelrainbolt.com slash podcast 45, where you can also subscribe and get future show notes sent right to your inbox. What are your favorite resources for people to dive deeper into this topic, Diane? Yeah, I have a couple that I wanted to mention. One is Soulful Simplicity by Courtney Carver. And I feel like she just really kind of got in on this whole minimalism trend before it became a trend. And so I... (laughs) recommend that book it not only has to do with maybe paring down your possessions but just paring down your uh, maybe your mindset and your schedule so minimalism applies to not just our tangible possessions possessions but really your whole life and then the other one is the more of less by joshua becker and i also really love what he has to say in that book he also wrote one I think it was last year that went through the home and decluttered the home room by room. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm slipping on the name of that right now. The minimalist home. I think. Yes. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, mm-hmm. and those are, all of his books are really excellent. And he just is really a, a witty, honest writer and it's really approachable and he really breaks it down into easy steps for you. So I highly recommend both of those books and the minimalist moms podcast. If I'm going to do a shameless plug. Thank you. Yes. The minimalist moms podcast. Um, everyone should be listening to, and you should all also be following Diane on Instagram and your handle is just minimalist moms podcast, right? Yep. That's correct. All right, and then I am going to link to a post that I have called Simplifying the Sentimental. It's just rachelrainbolt.com slash simplifying dash the dash sentimental, where 
I actually just wrote that article when I was in the midst of going through all of my sentimental stuff. So there's just photos of all the stuff I was talking about and links to different things that I found helpful. Um, and then I'm also going to link to my minimalism books blog post because I have a few books that I have found to be super helpful in going through and minimalizing, minimalizing, minimizing <laughs> everything. <laughs> we need some grammar expert up in here. Um, so yeah, I'm going to link to all of those. And oh, Diane, thank you so much for coming on and sharing this conversation with me. I've been a longtime listener of your podcast and you are so genuine and down to earth and enjoyable to share a conversation with in almost real life. Yeah, absolutely. This was really fun. I enjoyed my time. Thanks for having me.